Hey, I'm Pastor Andrew Ebanks, lead pastor at the Agape Family Worship Center. We pray this message and resource will stir up your affections for Jesus and encourage you in your calling. Use this resource in conjunction with you belonging to a local church that is helping to shape and shepherd you in Jesus Christ. If these resources bless you, would you consider giving back to us here at Agape? You can visit us at agapekman.ky slash giving to see how you can do that. Again, we pray this blesses, encourages, and grows you in your love for Jesus Christ. Well, we've been in, over the last couple of weeks in a series called Brave, talking about finding a fearless faith. Because for you and for me, the thing that we need most is, is to be people of faith, to be, to be people who live out the word of God, the people who trust in God, people who, who live according to the things of God. And, and as the Bible tells us, it's impossible to live for God and not live in faith. And, and so we've spent the last couple of weeks talking about this. We actually started on New Year's Eve where we started talking about crazy faith. And then last week we talked a little bit about just a little bit of faith, or, or you could say it a different way, baby faith, taking those baby steps. And, and so uh, I want to just come back a little bit to some of that and, and then we'll dive into today's things because we talked about crazy faith and I want to give you a definition of what it means to have crazy faith. Crazy faith means thoughts and actions that lack reason, but trusting fully in what you cannot explicitly prove. And so what that means is that when you look at the situation that you're in, hey, you're going, man, I know this doesn't make sense for some reason, but I'm going to believe that it could happen. I believe that it can happen. And so for you, it might be that you're, you're feeling sick, but, but for some reason, you, you, even though you heard what the doctor said, you're believing for a healing, a miracle to take place. You, you know what your finances look like, and you don't know where the money's going to come from to pay the bills or to get food, but, but you're believing and you're trusting that, man, I know I don't have it, but I know that it's going to come from somewhere. Something is going to happen. And, and, and so this is how the people in Scripture think. When we look at Scripture, what we see over and over, this is the kind of faith that David had when he went to fight Goliath. Here's a little shepherd boy who, who's out in the fields taking care of sheep who goes to a, a military camp with trained soldiers who are in fear for their lives because they're afraid of Goliath. And David walks in, not even wearing any armor, not even with any military equipment, with his slingshot, and goes to fight Goliath and kills him, all because he had crazy faith. I mean, you got to be crazy to do something like that. Noah, when he built the ark, it was the same thing. God tells him, Noah, you, it's time to, to build this ark, and it hadn't even rained on the earth yet, some scholars say. And so he didn't even know what rain was, but yet he still went and built this boat, built this ark because of this. Abraham and Sarah, who, who were in their, their old age, I mean, they weren't just like, like in their 50s or maybe in their early 60s. I mean, they were, they were well past that in their, their old age, and they trusted God for a child. This is the kind of faith that people throughout the pages of Scripture are filled with, and the kind of faith that I believe God's calling us to be brave and fearless to have this year, that we would see some incredible things happen in our lives, in our family, in our community, because we're trusting in God and having faith. Remember this, as I said, that it's only crazy until it happens. 
It's only crazy until it happens. And this is what we see happen. Everybody thought Noah was crazy. He preached for 120 years and nobody believed him that there was a flood coming until it started raining. It's only crazy until it happens. And what's crazy in one season is counted as faith in another season. And and so crazy faith, as we said last week, starts with just having a little bit of faith. And as long as we have a little bit of faith, Jesus said, how much faith do you need? You need five-gallon buckets of faith? No. How much faith do you need? Mustard seed faith. If you have faith the size of a mustard seed, you can move mountains. That is what Jesus tells us. And so oftentimes, you know, we, we as pastors tend to get all kinds of questions. And I know that as we've talked over the past couple of weeks, you're thinking about situations in your life and you're looking at things in your life and you're going, man, how does this apply to my life and to my family and to my situation? So let's look at uh, just, just three questions that, that often come to us as pastors. One of those questions is this, how do you know you're moving in faith? How do you know that you're moving in faith? The other question is, how are you confident that what you're believing in faith or or what you're believing for in faith is done? And then third question that oftentimes comes to us pastors is, is how can you be sure that the thing you're believing for is going to happen? And so let me give you a very theological answer to this question to help you answer these questions. And it's really, really simple. I'll break it down real easy for you. You can't. You can't. You, you can't know that any of these things are going to happen because if you knew it was going to happen, if you could figure it out, it's not faith. Faith is not, the, faith is not being able to figure it out because if you could figure it out, it would not be faith. And so for us, as we, as we look at life, each of us want assurances, right? I mean, we want to be assured. Like, like if I called you and I said, man, I got a million dollar check waiting here for you. You're like, really? I want to see it. Show it to me. T- take a picture and send it to me on WhatsApp. I, I want proof first to know that, that you've got that check for me. If I say I got a million dollars cash, show me the money. I want to see it first. We want the assurance of something before we really believe in it. But that's not called faith. Faith is believing in what you cannot see. Remember what crazy faith is? Thoughts and actions that lack reason but trusting fully in what you cannot explicitly prove. And and so that's what faith is all about. It's about believing in what you cannot explicitly prove, and you can't be sure that everything that you're believing for is going to happen. Am I talking to you all this morning? I mean, you've experienced that, right? Man, I believe God for some things, and it didn't come to pass. I, I've, been, I've been believing God that this was going to happen and it never happened. And, and, and so how do we deal with this? And the reality is, is that you can't know and have assurance that everything you're believing for will happen. So how do we deal with this? Well, let me say it to you this way. Faith begins where your understanding ends. Faith begins where your understanding ends. And and so when you come to the end of what you know, that's the place where faith begins for you. You can't have faith for what you already know. You can't have faith that the chair can hold you up if you're sitting in it already and it's holding you up. That's not faith. That's something you already know. No, but if you said, you know what, man, this chair looks, this chair don't look quite so stable, but you know what, I'm going to have faith and sit in this chair that it's going to hold me up. And you sit in it and it holds you up. Guess what? That was faith. And, And so this is what we need to understand that when we come to the end of our understanding, that's the place where faith begins. And that's where God wants to lead us. 
That's where God wants to take us. He wants to take us to places where we come to the end of ourselves, and so there's a gap in between what we know and what God is able to do, and that's the place where faith begins. That's the place where faith grows. That's the place, the place where faith happens. And so you're looking at life and you're looking at the situation and you're going, man, I, I don't have any money for the bills. You've come to the end of yourself, but you're trusting and believing, God, there's going to be money there to pay the bills. You don't have any food and you're wondering, how am I going to get food for my family? But, but, but God says, you know what, I, I, but you say, God, you know what, I'm going to trust and believe you that, that I've exhausted myself. I don't know where it's coming from, but God, you will provide. That's faith. I don't have money for school. I don't have money for, for whatever it is. God, I'm going to trust and believe in you. The doctor says, gave you a report that said this is what it is and this is what it looks like. But God, I'm going to trust and believe in you in faith that you are able. Am I talking to y'all this morning? Did you, did you all go partying last night? Do, do, I mean, this should be exciting you. Because as we understand faith, we, we, we've got to understand that, that what happens is, is that God wants to grow and use our faith for great things. You. Yeah, you. And, and so we need to not be paralyzed by our desire for understanding. I want to share some things with you this morning through this sermon that I, that I pray really encourages you and really helps you with where you're at because I know so many people who are paralyzed in their faith. They've got faith for salvation. They've got faith to believe God, that, that, that God will save them from hell, but they don't move beyond that faith. And I'm telling you this morning, church, God wants to move you from faith that simply saves to an active faith that works. And God's been preparing us for this for some time. If you just look at the sermons and the things that we as a church have been talking about and looking at and doing over the last year alone, God has been preparing us for this moment right here. So this sermon, this series is coming out of some things that God's already been speaking to us for quite a bit of time. And I want to encourage you to not just be like, man, that was a good sermon, but to take this to heart. Because I really believe that if we take this to heart, we will see some mighty workings of God in our church, in our community, in our lives, in our families. And so I don't know about you, but I'm excited and if you ain't excited, you need to get excited because that's where faith starts. And so what we need today is to recognize that God will never call us to a sure thing. And I know that shocks. I'm going to mess with your theology this morning. God will never call you to a sure thing. And this is where some of us kind of get, get tripped up because it's like, well, God, I'm not so sure. Lord, like, like how, how the details of this going to work out, God? Like, I don't know. Should I, should I do this or should I do that? Or should, should, like, like, what, God, what do I need to do here? Okay, Lord, if I take this step, then what's the next step? And, and we're freaking out with the, the details, but here's the problem. The problem for us is this. I know God can, but, but I can't. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not able. And so I know God can heal people, but I can't heal people. You want me to go to the hospital and, and pray for somebody who's sick? I, I can't heal nobody. You want me to, 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 to give what out of my finances? I don't even have enough to pay the bills. You, you, you want me to... To, to go to, to the doctor, I don't have money for the doctor, and, and I know I've got this problem, but I don't have money for insurance. I don't, I don't have money for, to, to be able to pay these doctor's bills. And we know what the end of ourselves looks like, but let me tell you something this morning that's so important. There will always be a gap between what you are able to do and what God is able to do. There will always be a gap. And that gap is where faith comes into play. And so there's a gap between what your abilities are and what God's abilities are. 
There, there, there's a, a place and a space where we're looking at it and we're going, God, I've come to the end of my rope. I've come to the end of myself. Where do I go from here? Because I can't see a road ahead of me. And that's the place where we begin to trust in God. And so what I want to talk to you about this morning is not crazy faith. I don't want to talk to you about just a little bit of faith. I want to talk to you a little bit about maybe faith. Because maybe this morning there's some things that we need to have faith for, that, that maybe there's some things that we could believe God for, some, some things that would be the right choice. Because, you know, there's a lot of things that we want to believe and know with 100% certainty, but we don't know with 100% certainty. Let me tell you something. You will never be 100% certain about anything in your life. We like to wait till we get to that stage and to that point where it's like, man, I just, I know, I know. And, and there's very few things in life, if anything, that you'll be like, yes, 100%, I knew, 100%. And so maybe this is the right choice. Maybe it's the right job. Maybe it's the, 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 the right person. You know, some of, us, some of us married somebody, we're still not sure after all these years whether we married the right person or not. Let's be honest. See, some of you laughing because you know what I'm talking about. And if you didn't laugh, you're the person. Just kidding. <laughs> but God doesn't need a lot. God didn't, God didn't say, man, you got to have five-gallon buckets of faith. you got, you, you, man, you got to have a garbage can full of faith. No, he said, you just need to have Faith the size of a mustard seed. And if you don't know the size of a mustard seed, it could literally fit between my fingers. It's smaller than a grain of rice. And God says all you need is one of those, not a handful, not, not, not just a, a palm full, not, not any of those things. He said just one mustard seed of faith is all you need, and God can do a lot with that. He can do a lot with that. So, so let me tell you this this morning. This is, this is critical. It, this is one of the most key and important parts of our faith that, that, that I have to share with you this morning. Because if you don't get this, it's going to mess up a whole bunch of things for you. Faith, listen to me good. Faith is not found in what you are believing for. Faith is found in who you are believing in. It's not found in what you are believing for. It's found in who you are believing in. So what do I mean by that? You wanted a house, so you had faith in the house. And you prayed and you said, God, I'm believing. Oh, Lord, we found a perfect house. Lord, I love this house. It is so fantastic, God. And I just, Lord, I've got faith. Lord, I'm praying. I'm believing. I'm trusting God. And the bank turned you down. Or somebody else came in and bought it before you did. Or, or, or you didn't have quite the money that you needed to get the house, and you're looking at it, and man, you're disappointed. Why? Because your faith was in the house. And because you didn't get the house, you think, man, God must not have been with me. Like, where, God, why, Lord, like, Lord, that was the perfect house. Why didn't I get that house, God? And what you didn't know is that God was actually making your faith work in that moment because God knew that within a year, you were going to be leaving where you were living to go live somewhere else. And that when you were going to live in that place, that you were going to find your spouse over there. But if you had stayed in that house, if you had bought that house, you might have missed that opportunity there because you're looking at it and you're going, man, God, I'm so disappointed in this. But rather, instead of saying that you, and your faith being in the house, your faith instead is in God. God, well, that house didn't work out. So there must be a better house available that you have in store for me, God. And so your faith is not in the what. Your faith is where? In the who. And when your faith is in the who, that makes all the difference. When your faith is in God, he's working when you can't. Why is it that we go, man, I've got faith only when God does what we want him to do? So, man, I'm believing God for this. Oh, and then it works out. And I, man, I knew it. I had faith. Praise God. And then it doesn't work out. And we're like, oh, man, God, what's wrong with my faith? God, where are you? Lord, why would you abandon me? God is working when you see it, and he's also the same God that's working when you don't see it. 
One of my favorite quotes of all time says, says God is doing 10,000 things in your life at one time, and you might be aware of three of them. Might be aware of three of them. God is always working. He's always doing things in your life. How many of us are thankful that there are some prayers that God just didn't answer? I mean, I don't know about you, but praise God. I look back at my life and I see some things and I'm like, Lord, thank you that didn't work out. Lord, thank you that's not where I am. Lord, thank you that's not who I'm with. Amen. And you look back at your life and you go, God, thank you that you didn't answer that prayer. And that is your faith at work. Because your faith is not in the what. Your faith is in the who. And when your faith is in God, wherever he leads, you follow. And so he's working when you see it. He's working when you don't see it. But when we put our faith in the what, and we don't see the healing, we get discouraged. When we put our faith in the, in the what, and we don't see that healing and the person dies, and we're like, man, God, why? What, what, Lord, why? Why did that happen, Lord? How, how, how could that happen, God? Like, Lord, we had faith. We were believing. And, and Lord, we, we trusted in what you, and Lord, you, you said, Lord, you said your word to heal our disease, but they died. But maybe, maybe God healed them in heaven. See, that, that's the part that we don't like, right? I, 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 I'll, I'll be honest with you. I, 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 I have a, a, a humble and honest moment with you. I remember when my father was sick, someone said that to me. Like, like I know you're praying and believing and trusting God that, that God's going to heal your father, but he's going to get healed one way or another. I said, what do you mean? They said, he'll either heal him here or he'll heal him there. And I almost said, I rebuke you, Satan. He either going to heal him here or he ain't going to heal him at all. That, that was me. I, I was upset. I mean, I was, I was fuming. I was angry. I was like, what oh, foolishness you coming and talking to me? But as I began to grow in my understanding, I said, you know what? God, I love in Revelation where it says that there's a tree for the healing of the nations in heaven. Because how messed up would it be? You die and you go to heaven, you're still walking around with that limp. Like, you still got arthritis. It's like, God, I thought, I thought things were supposed to be better up here. But you see, do we have faith for that? You see, because if our faith is only in the what, then, then when that happens and the person dies, we lose all faith because we go, man, God, what, Why? But when our faith is in God, we say, God, you know what? Maybe you had a better plan, and I can't see it, and I can't understand it. And Lord, even if you explained it, I probably couldn't fathom it. But my faith is in you. I'm trusting in you. So you put your faith in the who, in God, not in the what. Because if we really, let me tell you how we know this. Let me, let me put some scripture to this to help us believe. Romans chapter 8, verse 28, what does it say? For we know, what do we know? We know that all things work together for the good of those who, let me read the whole scripture for you because I'm, I'm quoting it from memory. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. So since we know that by faith this happens, right? We know it. That as a believer, that, that it doesn't matter how good or how bad life happens to you, that God is using all those things for your good. You got to have some faith to believe that. Because man, when you get that report from the doctor... Man, when that, when that bad thing happens, when, when your spouse leaves you and walks out on you, when, when all kinds of horrible and terrible, difficult things happen in life, if you don't believe that, God, all things work together for my good because I love you and you love me, God, then guess what? You're going to have an even harder time with it because the realities of life are harsh. But with faith, we can move through it. So, so there's no in-between on this. You either believe the word of God that all things work together for your good or you don't. 
You either believe it or you don't. And what we understand in this is that an L is not really a loss. An L is a lesson. We don't really suffer a loss. We, we, we really gain a lesson from this and we l- are able to learn from what we're going through. Look at what, what Hebrews chapter 10 verse 38 says. He says, but my righteous ones, this is, this is the Lord, but my righteous ones shall do what? Shall live by faith. Some translations put it this way. The just shall live by by faith, those who love God, those who trusted in God for salvation, which means what? That if you have given your life to God, you ain't got an option, sweetheart. You have to live by faith. There's no, there's no if, ands, or buts. It is a, not an option. It is the way that it is. You have to live by faith, and there is no option in this. This is the fine print of salvation here. So if you, if you have faith to say to God, God, I trust you that you gave me fire insurance, Lord, I don't have to go to hell. Then you also have to continue to live by faith. As Paul says, he says, for we walk by faith, not by sight. So if this is the way that we as Christians are called to live, then the reality is, is that for you and I, that we have to realize that there's always going to be a gap. There's going to be a gap between what your job is able to provide for you and what God is able to provide for you. There's going to be a gap between what what the doctor can do for you and, and what this one or that one or the other one or what we can do for one another and what God is able to do for you and in you. And that's why sometimes we come along and man, and we go... This, we hear people say it all the time, this is your season, this is, this is your time, this is your year, just claim it by faith and it's going to happen and awesome things and wonderful things are going to happen in your life and you've been saying that for 10 years and now you're going, man, God, I've been saying this for 10 years, I don't even believe it anymore. I, I, like, <sighs> Lord, I've been saying this is going to be my year for 10 years. And I see everybody else getting a year, but Lord, this, I don't see my year. When's, when's it going to be my turn, Lord? And the reality is this, is that God is always there. And he already knows what he's going to do in your life. The miracle is waiting on you. You're not waiting on your miracle. Because if you need it, he's the good provider who is able to give it. So, so your miracle is waiting on you. You're not waiting on your miracle. And, and, and what happens here, look at the Apostle Paul. Just, just, just ask Paul. When you look at the life of Paul, what did, what did Paul do? Paul, for years, went around killing Christians. I mean, Paul was just, just massacring the Christians. I mean, he, just, he was killing them left, right, and center. Paul didn't care. He, you, you name the name of Christ, you're dead. Don't let Paul find you. All of a sudden, on the road to Damascus, he has an encounter with Jesus and, and, and is blinded. And what ends up happening is, is in the process of being blinded, someone comes along and lays hands on him and prays for him, and, and his eyesight is restored. And in the process, Paul gets saved, and all of a sudden, he goes around the place preaching the gospel and ends up writing basically a third of the New Testament. I mean, just absolutely incredible life that he lives. And, and, and Paul is kind of... Like, when we talk about super Christians, Paul is like super, super Christian. He's like the one that, that like, you got Jesus and then, like, not even a close second, but if there was, like, a second place, you would have, like, Paul. That's the way that we kind of look at Paul. And, and, and when you see this and you see the life of Paul and you see that, that, that Paul was a man who had some deficiencies, like, like Paul... You look at Paul and like, if there's anybody who, who deserved a miracle, it was Paul. If there was anyone who, who, who deserved for God to do things in, in their life, it was, like, it was like, it should be Paul, right? I mean, he, he declared the gospel. Literally thousands of people got saved because of him. He, he was a pastor to so many pastors. I mean, Paul was just like this incredible giant guy of faith, and yet... He, When we get to 2 Corinthians chapter 12, we see that Paul has this moment where he's talking about what, it doesn't tell us what it is, but he calls it a thorn in his side, a thorn in his flesh. We don't know what it was. 
We don't know whether it was an di- addiction, whether it was an illness, whether it was something else. We have no idea what this thorn in his flesh was because he doesn't tell us. But what he does tell us is that he pleaded with God three times. He's like, Lord, please take this away from me. Please, Lord, take it away from me. Please, Lord, take it away from me. And God wouldn't remove it. What do you mean God wouldn't remove it? God, look at what Paul says. Look at what God says to Paul. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 9. He says, but God said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. For my power is made perfect in weakness. See, you may look at your life and see some deficiencies, but God looks at your weaknesses and says, ah, that's the place where my grace is going to work best. You look at your life and you, you see the deficiencies in your own life. You see, you see the issues and the lacks in your own life and you go, God can't use me because of this. And God's looking at you, no, I'm going to use you in spite of this. And Paul's over here, and he's crying out to God, and he's like, God, please take it away. Please take it away, Lord. And what does God do? God says, no, no, my grace is sufficient in the middle of whatever it is you feel like you're lacking. Paul, just before this, compares himself to someone. He says, he says I know a brother who was caught up to the third heaven. And he told me all about it, and he told me how incredible and amazing this was. But he says, but I'm not going to boast about that. He says, instead, I'm going to boast in my weakness. See, when we begin to learn that when we're deficient, that God doesn't look at that and go, man, shame on you. God looks at that, and he goes, hey, that's an opportunity for faith. That's an opportunity for faith. Because you know what? Maybe we're better when we're dependent on God's grace. Maybe we're better when we're dependent on God's grace. You see, God is always going to leave us with a gap, with, with that deficiency, so that faith can fill it. Because, I mean, Matt, I mean, how much, I mean, how much faith did Paul really need, right? I mean, Paul literally... Like, healed sick people, raised the dead. I mean, all, all kinds of crazy things happen around Paul. And, and, and yet, he's in this moment, and he's, he's got this deficiency. Like, you would think Paul, Paul has the faith for it, right? But God says, man, my grace is sufficient for my power is made perfect in weakness. Let me ask you this. What are you trying to fill the gap with? What are you trying to fill the gap with? Are you trying to fill the gap with your talent? You're trying to fill the gap with your money? You're trying to fill the gap with with the hustle and working hard and and, and things? What is it that you're trying to fill the gap with? Because I'm telling you, stop trying to fill the gap with those things. I'm not saying that those things are bad. I'm saying the gap needs to be filled with faith. And if you're going to live by faith, you've got to fill those deficiencies with faith faith. You've got to fill those gaps with faith because that's really the only answer for these issues, for these problems. I mean, look at the children of Israel for a second. When you stop and you consider the children of Israel, the children of Israel were wandering through the desert. No food, no nothing. And you know what God says? God says, you know what? I'm going to provide for you every single day. And so, They're like, okay, great, God, sounds good. And so you know what God did? God sent manna from heaven every single day to take care of them. So every day that they woke up, God had food there for them. I mean, that's absolutely amazing. I mean, can you imagine you wake up every morning, and I mean, there's just breakfast on the table for you. You walk out of your room, you get out of bed, and all of a sudden you just, oh, egg and bacon? You can tell I'm hungry, right? And I mean, they, they just, they go and, and they, they get this food. And, and, and you know what's so crazy about this? 
is that they would take and they would eat, and then they had enough for the day. But you know what the Bible says? That anyone who tried to take more than enough for the day, you know what happened to it? It would rot. So in one day, the food would just go bad. Kind of like Cinderella, right? The clock strikes midnight, and that's it. Like everything just reverts back. The food just goes bad. I mean, that would be terrible if that happened in our refrigerators. But yet, guess what happened? The food would go bad at the end of the day when they tried to store up for more than than one day. But guess what? The next morning, there was fresh manna from heaven yet again. The same God who provided yesterday is the same God who will provide today. And he's the same God who will provide tomorrow. He is always going to provide for us. What does scripture say? I have never seen the righteous forsaken. I've never seen them begging bread. So so when we look at this and we see this and we say, man, God is going to take care of you, not just today. He's going to take care of you tomorrow. I'm not just making stuff up. I'm telling you what we have proved time and time again because you have survived all of your worst days. Amen? You're still here. That's how I know that. So that means God's brought you through all of the things that you thought, man, I don't know how we're going to make it through this one. And you've made it to today. God will provide. But here's the thing. We've got to have faith in God every day. Because we've got to be careful of this word independence when it comes to scripture. When it comes to faith. Because some of us would rather be independent of God than dependent on God. Let me prove it to you. You're going through something difficult in your life, whatever it is. Maybe it's money. Maybe it's your marriage. Maybe, maybe it's something else. I don't know. Maybe your health. And man, every single morning you get up, you're in the word, you're declaring scripture over yourself, you're praying, you're seeking God, you're desperate. Lord, I need you to move in this situation. Lord, I need you to fix this. Lord, I need you to provide. And every day you go before the Lord and then God does it. And as soon as God does it, you're like, thank you, Lord. All right, cool. Now uh, back to life as usual. We seek God most when we are in our worst. But when life is going good and life is normal, we don't seek God as much, if at all. But then something happens, Lord, where have you been, Jesus? I can't find you. Where did you go? I've been standing here the whole time. Where did you go? Because his word says he will never leave us nor forsake us. That means no matter how bad we are, no matter how horrible we are, no matter how sinful we are, no matter how pretty or how ugly we look, he says, I'm always going to be there. Always right next to you waiting. The question is not where did God go? The question is where did you go? And, And what we do is, is that God, we wait on God, we pray, we get desperate, we go before the Lord, and the Lord blesses us. And sometimes the blessing that God gives us makes us self-sufficient. And so we instead think we can then live without God. So Lord, I didn't need you. I, I needed you when I was broke, but now I've got money, so I don't need you in my finances anymore, Lord. Lord, I, didn't, I needed you when, when, when I was sick, but Lord, I'm healed now, so I don't need you in my health anymore, God. Lord, I needed you when my marriage was broken and falling apart, but my marriage is stable now, God, so I don't need you anymore, God. And we instead turn our back on God rather than depending on God in faith. They say, God, you know what? My marriage is stable now, God. You're going to make it better. Lord, my finances are good now, God. You're going to make it better. And that doesn't mean that you're going to get more. It means that God's going to continue to bless you in the middle of that. And he's going to continue to work in those situations. And he's going to be able to continue to do things through you. And so, man, you used to be able to give maybe 15% before or 10% or whatever it was. Now you can give 20 or 30%. And you're like, man, praise God, look at what you're doing in my finances. 
Before, you were just able to, to barely get through the month without throwing up your food or, or whatever it was, or, or, or your anxiety was crushing you. Now, all of a sudden, you're helping people who are struggling with the same thing you were struggling with. Why? Because God has done more in you by faith. But we become self-sufficient, or we think we become self-sufficient after God does one work in us. Like, man, Lord... Thank you for blessing me. All right, gonna drive off now in my, ni- my nice new fancy car. See you later. We've gotta live by faith every single day. Living by faith is not what we do just simply when things don't go good. Living by faith is what we wake up every morning and say, God, that's what I'm gonna do today. I don't know in what area, in what way, or how, in what capacity, but God, you are going to help me in some way by faith today. You're going to bring me through by faith today. I am going to live by faith today. I want us to look at at Abraham for a minute. Abraham, at one time, he was called by a different name. His name was Abram. And, uh, and God changed his name to Abraham. But Abraham is seen as the father of our faith, essentially. When we're in Genesis chapter 12, I want you to see something that happens here in Genesis chapter 12. In Genesis 12, 1, it says this, Now the Lord said to Abram, who said what? The Lord. The Lord said it to Abram first. So what this shows us, first of all, let me stop here before I read anything else, is that Abraham had a daily life with God. He, he had a daily life talking with God, his, his life. He had a personal relationship with God. Abraham didn't just, just show up to church once in a while or, or he didn't just, you know, read a scripture every once in a blue moon. No, no. He had a daily life with God. And it was in the process of his daily communication and time with God that God said to him, I want you to do something for me. See, some of us want to know God's will. We want to know, we want to have God's blessing. We want to know what God wants us to do. Lord, what's your purpose for my life? God, I need you to lead me and guide me. And and Lord, I, I want to do things for the kingdom of God, but we're not spending any time with God. We're not. We're we're, we're not stopping to to spend time in the word, really. We're not stopping to pray. We're not taking any time to worship the Lord and and, and to be with God. And I can tell you this. It doesn't matter if me or somebody else is your favorite preacher. It doesn't matter who you like listening to or or who your favorite singer is or whatever any of that is. You could you could have your most the most wonderful preacher in the whole entire world. It does not make a difference if you are not walking in a daily relationship with God. That's why coming to church on Sunday is not going to fix everything in your life. No matter how good the church service is, if you yourself don't have a personal daily life with God, it is going to affect you. And so I could get up here and preach my guts out. We, we could have the best preachers in the world standing on the stage, preach their guts out. It would not make a difference if you were not spending time with God for yourself. And we want to live by faith and do great things in the kingdom of God by faith, but we're not spending any time with God. And then we wonder why God, you know, here I am, Lord, and I'm just trying to, I'm just trying to, I'm just trying to do this Christian thing, Lord. Like, I, I'm just, I, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to figure this out. And can I tell you that God still speaks today? He still speaks today. He speaks in an audible voice, sure, but, but more often than God speaking in an audible voice, he speaks through his word. And the reason why more people are so hungry for a word from God is because they don't read the word of God. And if they spent time in the word of God, they would get a word from God. But so many people are just Christians and they don't even have a clue what this says. 
And it's not a matter of, oh, Pastor Andrew, you up here judging me, and I, I, I don't like to read and whatever. That's not what this is about. If I told you, man, you could have eternal life, all you had to do was read this book, you know, there'd be a lot of people who would die early. Just because they don't wanna, they don't wanna do that. If I told you, man, you could hear from God, you just gotta open his word and read what he's said to you. He's written you a love. You know how many people would still go to hell and still do go to hell? Why? Because they don't wanna read this. We would rather chase people up and down all over the world and have them prophesy and give a word to us and go directly to the Lord and say, God, what do you want to say to me? God, you, you know what would be absolutely ridiculous? If I wanted to find out what my wife wanted to say to me and she was on the other side of the world, and so I just jump on a plane Spend thousands of dollars, not just in airfare, but in, in COVID-19 tests because, you, go, you I mean, they'll swab everything these days. You got to get a test here, there, and everywhere. And then by the time you get there, you go, hey, what did you want to say to me? You know what my wife, as smart as she is and as beautiful as she is, you know what she's going to do? She's going to look at me and she'll say, as happy as I am to see you, you could have picked up the phone to call me to ask me that question. You didn't have to fly all the way across the world, spend all that money just to ask me one question to turn around, get on the plane, and go back home. And that's how some of us treat God. When all God says to us is, hey, listen, I've already wrote, written you a letter. It's called the Bible. And in here, I tell you everything. Because guess what? If, it, if you can't prove it by this, it ain't from God. If you can't prove it by the word of God, it ain't from God. So regardless of what anyone tells you, guess what? It has to come from here first. And if it doesn't come from here first, it ain't coming from God. So, so you got to spend time with him. So just go to him for yourself and let him speak to you. Because you know how many Christians talk to me, Pastor? I just want to hear the voice of God. I just want to hear what God has to say to me. And God speaks primarily to, through, through two ways. He speaks through his word first and foremost. And then he speaks through those who surround us. The people around us. Like this morning, we got a word from God this morning. During worship. Why? Because the people who are close to God hear God speaking. That's why you want to surround yourself with godly people. Why? Because they're able to speak into your life because they're spending time with God. But guess what? They're not the only ones who are supposed to spend time with God. So are you. You are too. So let me, let me, keep, let me keep reading the scriptures. So now the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country, that's the place where he lives, and your kindred, that's his family, and your father's house to the land, look at this last part, that I will show you. Where are we going, God? I'll show you. Yeah, but like, could I at least have a name? I will show you. Like, if I said to you, hey, let's go get in my car. Where are we going? I'll show you. Mm-mm. Where are we going, Pastor Andrew? I will show you. You know, we, we, we don't like that idea. We don't like that dynamic at all. But, but what happens is, is that Jesus takes the wheel, he sits in the front seat, and he says, buckle up. Where are we going, Jesus? Buckle up. We're going somewhere. Does it matter where we're going? He, 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 he just he tells us, I'm going to show you when you need to know. Like your kids, right? When they're growing up. Where are we going, mom and dad? Get in the car. Yeah, but where are we going? Get in the car. But where are we going? You're going to get in the car first. Why? Because you're going to do what I 
said to do. Why? Because I said so. God does the same thing with us as his kids. He says, man, listen, I'm telling you, just get in the car and let's go. You know, remember when that song came out years ago and everybody was singing it, oh, Jesus, take the wheel. And we want to sing that and we want to talk about that and it sounds real nice, but, but what happens when Jesus actually takes the wheel? We, we start struggling and we're like, man, Jesus, I don't, I, 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 Jesus, I don't know. Let me give you some things about faith. Four things about faith. First of all, faith is uncomfortable. What does he tell him to do? He says, leave your country. That's comfort. Man, I, I'm going to move to a country. I don't know nobody in the country. I don't even know which country it is. Can you imagine if God told you today, go to the airport. You're getting on a plane. All right, Lord, which plane and to which location? I will show you when you get there. But Lord, I don't know if I got enough money for the plane ticket. I will show you when you get there. It's uncomfortable. And the reality is, is that if you're comfortable, you're not in faith. Because some of us, God has done some things in our lives, and we're comfortable, and we're sitting comfortable now. We're sitting good with the money. We're sitting good with the health. We're sitting good in all these areas. And where we're comfortable, we're not living in faith. So being uncomfortable is a sign that faith can work. If you're uncomfortable, you're in a place where you can use faith. Secondly, faith will be unfamiliar. God tells him you're going to leave your kindred. That means you're going to leave the people that you know. You're going to leave behind those people. You know, there's a, there's a lot of us that, that, that we're not going to try something new. We're, we're, we're just, we're not going to do it. It's like kids, right? Yeah, you ever tried to, to give a child something new to eat? Particularly the kids that are like really stingy with what they eat. Like, what is it? It's chicken. This don't look like the chicken I ate yesterday. It's still just chicken, but it's not the chicken that I eat. And some of us are this way, right? Try something new. Mm -mm, I don't What's in it? Just try it and see if you like it. No, what are the ingredients? Just try it. It tastes good. I ate it and I'm fine. You want me to eat it first? Yeah. Okay, I ate it first. Yeah, but how does it, what does it taste like? It tastes like chicken. Try it. They say that about a lot of things. I don't want to eat no, you know, intestines or, or, or you know, octopus or whatever. Like, uh, no, you won't try anything new at all. And, and to get you to try something new, and here's the thing. How will you learn anything new if you won't try something new? And how will God lead you by faith into some new areas of your life if you are not willing to get unfamiliar with where you're at? Well, I'm not going to do it that way. Mm -mm. If God got to do it that way, <laughs> it ain't going to happen. And by faith, you have received what you have faith for. Because it's unfamiliar to you, you won't try it. Third, Faith will require a new provision. Here's the thing. We tie God to a formula. So, God, you did it this way before. So, Lord, you're going to do it that way again. So, you know what? Last time, I prayed and I fasted for two days and I got my miracle. So, you know what? This time, I'm going to pray and fast for two days again and I'm going to get my miracle. And you pray and fast for two days and you don't get it. Uh, Lord, I think, I think you broke something. Because I, I prayed and I, like, did you, did, you, did you mark it off, God? Yes, I prayed on day one and on day two. And I also fasted, breakfast, lunch. I, I did eat dinner, Lord. I, I, I did eat dinner. But, but breakfast and lunch, I, 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 yes, yes. Okay, do I get my miracle now? No? Huh? He, he said no. Why? Because we tie God to our formula. And we say, God, well, I did it this way, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do it this way again. And, and here's the thing. Jesus healed a lot of people, but he didn't do it the same way every time. So there were some people that Jesus healed, and all he did was speak to them. 
Other people, he laid hands on them. Other people, he spat in some mud and rubbed it across their eyes. Other people, he said, go and do this or go and do that, and they were healed in those ways. Jesus didn't heal everyone the same way every time. Some people he healed by saying, be healed. Other people, he said, your sins are forgiven. So, so we can't tie God to a formula. God will always require new provision when he's doing something new. And so God's going to give you what? Fresh manna every single day. Yesterday's manna is not going to help you today. That's why God says my mercies are new every morning. Because you can't live today off of yesterday's mercy. So God's providing something new today. And then the fourth thing is this. Faith will require vulnerability. Mm. Now, we don't like this one. But faith will force vulnerability in your life. You cannot be safe in faith. You cannot be safe in faith. And here's the thing. You don't need a bunch of people to get around you and agree with you and say, man, that's a great idea. I think you should do that. We don't need people to get around us and agree with us. What we need is people who bear down in faith with us and say, you know what? I'm going to believe God with you that that's going to come to pass. I'm going to pray with you. I'm going to trust God with you. That's the kind of people that we need in our lives. Because when you just come up with some crazy idea that God gave you, and you start telling people about it, and then people are like, um, you going to do what? Say what? Where, when, how? You got to be careful who you tell what God has told you. Because sometimes you tell people something, you tell the wrong person something that God told you. And all of a sudden, you went into that conversation full of faith and you walked away like, dear God, I was dumb. Like, how did I ever think I would do this? How how did I ever think that this would ever happen? And then, Lord, Lord, I must have been the devil telling me that. And you did hear from God, but you didn't ask God, God, who should I talk to about this first? See, not everybody is going to get in with you in faith. Some people are going to stay in the boat while you walk on water. But, 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 but still, you have to learn. Man, I, I, I saw this somewhere. I heard a pastor say this one time. He says, we've got to learn to be naked in faith. Because we've got to learn to be vulnerable and just, just, just show it all. That I don't mean to show up to church naked. What that means is that you you got to bear it all. You just got to be willing to be vulnerable and just say, hey, you know what? Here it is. Here's what God has said. Here's what God has done. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. And, And when you learn to do this, there's no way to be safe and be fully in faith. If you are just playing it safe, you're not living by faith. You know, there is a there is a way to live dangerously. Safely. When I say that, what I mean is this. For instance, your kids. If your kids, you, you, you want your kids to learn and to grow and to grow in wisdom. So, for instance, you, you, within reason, you can allow your kids to do certain things. So, for instance, are climbing on monkey bars dangerous? Well, they can be. But there's a, there's a safe way to, to do that. But here's the thing is that, is that how did you learn to climb on monkey bars when you were a kid? By climbing on monkey bars. And did you fall a few times? Yeah, you did. And did you scrape your knee a few times? Yeah, you did. And and did you get a few cuts and bruises along the way? Sure, but you figured it out until one day you were just going across those monkey bars like it was nothing. Why? Because you learned to take a risk within a controlled environment. What we have to learn is that God will always be with us and he will catch us when we fall, but we've got to be willing to step out of where is safe for us now and say, God, you know what? I've got to get across to the other side. So, Lord, I've got to go across these bars. And you can't move from one bar to the next unless you are willing to let go. If you're not willing to let go, You can't move forward fully in faith. See, the reality is, is this, is that you can't move an object that doesn't want to be moved. 
It is easier to move and direct an object that is in motion than it is to move an object that's standing still. And, and, and can you, all right, let me, let me put it this way. If we brought a car and we put the car right up in the front and we put the car in park, where are we going? Nowhere. But if we put that car in drive, that steering wheel, you can turn that in any direction you want. Guess what? The car is going to move that direction. It's going to, if you turn it to the right, it's going to go to the right. If you turn it to the left, it's going to go to the left. Why? Because it is easier to move something that is already in motion. But the minute you put those brakes on, where are you going? Nowhere. You put it in park, where are you going? Nowhere. So what God wants is he wants us to take a step of faith first and say, you know what, God, I'm going to be in motion. I might be moving slow, but I'm moving forward in faith. And God, I want you to direct my paths. You see, God can't direct our paths if we're not moving. What does the Bible say? Your word is a light unto my feet, a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. What does that mean? That means I'm walking and God is guiding me where to go. If I'm not walking anywhere, God can't move me to where he wants to move me because God's not going to just pick me up and throw me there. God wants me to walk to where he's leading me. It requires me and God. It requires me to walk in faith and God to direct my path. And so, When we recognize this, it makes all the difference in the world. But but let me show you something here. Pain is always anchored by the promise of faith. Pain is always anchored by the promise of faith. What do I mean by that? Genesis chapter 12, verse 2 to 4. So let's keep reading Abraham's story, right? God tells Abraham, he says, I'm going to move you away. And then look at what he says to him. He says, and I will make a great, of you a great nation, and I will bless you, and I will make your name great so that you will be a blessing. That's amazing, isn't it? Absolutely amazing. God tells him, you're going to be blessed so you can be a blessing. Imagine this. What if God would make you the answer to someone's prayer? What if, what, what if God would make you the answer to something? Like, like, we come across people all the time who need prayer, don't we? Like, we're walking around, and we see people, and we, and we go, man, like, like, hey, I'm going through something right now. Oh, can I pray for you? Like, that's great. But, 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 but what if, rather than you just showing up and praying for them, that we live so by faith that when we showed up, God's like, hey, you're the answer to the prayer. That you show up, and it's like, man, like, like, like hey, I, I'm going through something. I, 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 I need something. I, I'm going. I was like, hey, guess what? I sent you here so that you could be the answer to the need. I sent you here so that you could be the provision in this situation. I sent you here because you were blessed and you are blessed to be a blessing to them. Amen? And so when you show up, God's not just sending you there to pray for them. God's sending you there to be the blessing for them. Because you see, that's just, uh, that, I, ooh, that's good. Man, some, of y'all, some of y'all need to get more excited about what God wants to do in your life. So look at what he says, verse 3. And I will do what? I will bless those who bless you. And him who dishonors you, I will curse And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Let me tell you something. You this morning are sitting in Abraham's blessing. You are sitting in Abraham's blessing this morning. Because because of this scripture right here, because Abraham followed through in faith. If it was not for the faith of this man, you would not be blessed today. So so because of his faith, who are you going to bless by faith this morning? Who are you going to be a blessing to? So so verse 4 continues. And so Abram went as the Lord had told him. Where did he go? As the Lord told him. And Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. Now look at this. He's an old man. He's in his old age. 75 years old. And God's like, I've got a new adventure for you. Some of us are are in a room, are, are close to that age, and we're like, you want me to do what? Go where? How? No, thank you, Jesus. 
Some of us younger than that, we were like, "Mm -mm, I ain't going nowhere, Lord. But look at his posture when he left. You know what we don't see? We don't see Abram going, man, God, you want me to go, Lord, I'm an old man. And, and you, you want me to uproot my whole family and take my business and do all this. Like, Lord, I do all for this. He didn't do that. What do we see him do? He was humble, and as the Lord told him, he did it. He did what God told him to do. And so when it says, as the Lord told him, here's what that means for me and you. That means don't just make a plan and go do it. Don't just, don't just make a plan and go and do it. Make sure you've heard from God. Because the Lord will, will, will bless you. And while God will bless you wherever you go and what, and, and, and what you do, you need to hear from him first. Because if you don't hear from him, here's what happens. We, we get some scars along the way. And yes, his grace is sufficient. And he will bring us through. And his grace will cover us. But, but we will get some scars that God never intended for us to have. What I'm saying to you this morning is this, is that, is that our job is to be faithful and obedient. What's our job? To be faithful and obedient. That's what our job is. So when God says go, we say yes, sir. And we go. So why aren't more people living by faith? The reason why so many people aren't living by faith is because so many people believe that their doubt disqualifies them from being able to live the life that God has for them. See, we, we hear scriptures like you have to believe and not doubt. And don't get me wrong, that's scripture. That, we, 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 we know that. But, but here's the thing is that sometimes when we doubt, the enemy comes in and reinforces our doubt and we, we give up. The faith, we give up what, we, what we, 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 we feel like God's called us to do. But doubt is a part of the human experience. Doubt is a part, I should say it this way, of the fallen human experience. And even Jesus doubted. See, when you look at the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus was one-third of the plan, that, 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 or one-third of, uh, of the mastermind behind the plan to save all of humanity. And he gets here, and he does all these incredible miracles, and he gets to the Garden of Gethsemane, and he's on his knees, and he's talking to God, and he's, and he's like, uh, Father, uh, can we rethink this plan just a little bit, please? Uh, I, I, I'm not so sure I want to go through with this. Lord, if it's possible, let this, this cup be passed from me. But, but what is his next words? But nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. You see, when we get to the place where we can do that, where we can say, God, I know I'm struggling in doubt, and I know I'm having a hard time with this. But God says, hey, listen, I, I, I want you to understand that, yes, you may have some doubts about this, but if you live by faith, My will will be done. My will will be done because here's the thing. Your doubt is not the opposite of your faith. The opposite of faith is not doubt. You see, because doubt is actually a sign that you have faith. You're just struggling with it. Doubt is a sign that you have faith. Because, see, you wouldn't be doubting if you you didn't have faith. You wouldn't be struggling with it and going, man, I'm having a hard time trusting God for this. If you didn't have faith, you're struggling to apply that faith. You're struggling to use that faith. And you're going, man, Lord, I'm I'm having a hard time with this. But it doesn't mean that you don't have faith. You might be having a hard time with it. But the opposite of faith is not doubt. It's fear. Let me prove it to you. Mark chapter 4, verse 35 to 41. It says, and on that day when evening had come... He said to them, who who is he? He is Jesus. He said to them, the disciples, let us go across to the other side. And so he's the one who tells them to cross. He's the one who tells them to get in the boat. He's the one who says, hey, we're going to go ahead and do this. And he wouldn't have told them, hey, let's go across if he didn't know that they would make it to the other side. But look at what happens in verse 36. And leaving the crowd, they took him with them in the boat, and just as he was, and other boats were with him. 
and a great windstorm arose, and the waves were breaking into the boat so that the boat was already filling up with water. Man, they're going across. The storm comes. They're, they're in the middle of it, and they're going, we can't go back. We, we, we can only go forward. And, 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 and I don't know, but I mean, what, is there anybody here this morning that's going through a storm in their life? You, you're just willing to admit that this morning and say, man, I'm going through a storm. I got both hands up. Man. You're going through a storm? You're going through a storm. There's a few of us saying, hey, man, I'm going through something in my life, and I'm willing to acknowledge that in, in my own life. But here's the thing I want to show you. I want to show you what Jesus is doing. But Jesus was at the stern of the boat, asleep on a cushion, sleeping. He had a pillow, and they had to wake him up and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we're about to die? And he woke up, and he rebuked the wind, and he said, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm, and he said to them, Why are you so Afraid, have you still no faith? And they were filled with great fear and said to one another, Who then is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? I love Jesus' disposition. While we're frantic and in fear, Jesus is sleeping in peace. And, 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 and that, 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 that should be a comfort to each of us. Why? Because what we know is that when we are going through the midst of something and we're frantic and we're full of anxiety and we're overwhelmed, you know what two anxious people do when they get together? They get more anxious. I mean, can you imagine? Be like, man, I went to the doctor today. Oh, what, what did the doctor say? And, and, and you're both nervous and you're both, you're, you're both anxious and you both got anxiety and your blood pressure is going up and you're, you're sweating and you're, you're worried. And you're, just, just hurry up and tell me what you got to tell me because I'm, I'm, I'm anxious and you're anxious. But when one's anxious and one's calm, the other one can look on and say, hey, just, just, let's, let's just take a second. Let's just calm down for a moment. Your storms don't scare Jesus. As a matter of fact, your storms have to listen to Jesus. And you're in the midst of the storm and you're in the midst of something and and your fear is overtaking you and Jesus is here saying, hey, just have some faith and look at what I'm going to do. And they wake Jesus up frantic. And Jesus is like, maybe you should just have some faith. You know, maybe is a great word as a parent. Dad, can we have ice cream? Maybe. Dad, can we have popcorn? Maybe. Dad, can we go to the beach? Maybe. See, when I say maybe to my kids, my kids look on optimistically at my maybes. They almost take my maybes to mean yes. And you see... Because they know me, that's why they view it that way. And you see, for you and I, we've got to start looking at our situations a little differently and start saying, you know what? Maybe God will. Maybe God will. Maybe God will work in this situation Maybe God will do something here. Maybe this is a moment and an opportunity and a time where God could do something absolutely incredible. And maybe we just need to have a little bit of faith and watch what God's going to do. You know, Joshua didn't know the exact moment that the walls of Jericho would come down. But he knew what God told him to do. And he, he marched around, and I'm sure that the people of Jericho, while they were probably afraid at first because of these people, probably after a while started laughing at them, going, look at these fools walking around here. What do you think, what, if they're going to just keep walking, nothing's going to happen. Until on that last day, they did what God told them to do, and, 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 and they, they blew the horns, and they did all these things, and all of a sudden, the walls came tumbling down around Jericho. They looked crazy for seven days until it happened. And then it was faith. See, what I'm telling you is is that maybe we should just listen to what God said. 
Maybe today is the day that God's going to do something, but if you give up, you won't see that. If you let it go, if you just say, you know what, God, I'm tired of praying about this. God, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop. That. Then, then, then maybe you might just miss your miracle, but maybe today is the day that God is going to break through and do something absolutely incredible in your life. Noah, it's the same thing. Noah built that ark, and, and, and eventually it started to rain David went out to fight Goliath, and maybe he would win that battle. Maybe he would lose it, but he was going to fight it in faith. See, what I'm telling you is you only need a little bit of faith. All you need is 51%, and you've got more than half. That's it. You you don't need five-gallon buckets. You don't need to be 100% sure. You just got to know, all right, I believe this is God speaking to me, and I believe I'm trusting in the Lord. You know, when I married Emily, I didn't know if it would work. Matter of fact, I, I, I was so uncertain that I didn't even know if she was going to stay on our wedding day. Because uh, on our wedding day, I probably sent about three or four people to check to make sure she was still there. I'm serious. All my grooms, man, were like, you want, you want me to go check? I mean, I was bright red in the face, and I was like, yeah, go, go check and make sure she's still here, please. And the wedding was delayed by a little bit. There was, there was an issue, and, 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 and I go, guys, um, why don't you go check and make sure that she's still here, please? And time, I must have sent about three people to go and check to make sure. Does that tell you I had a whole lot of faith on my wedding day? Not a lot. I wasn't sure she was going to stay, and I wasn't sure that I was going to stay upright and awake. I thought I was going to pass out. She wasn't sure marrying me either because I'm going to marry this guy. I'm going to move across the ocean. I'm going to live somewhere I've never lived before, around people I've never met before. But we were at least 51% certain. We, we, we didn't need to be 100% certain to know how every single detail was going to work out, but we knew we had a word from God, and we trusted in that word, and we believed. And we believed in faith that it would happen, that it would work, and it did. You don't know if it's going to work. You can't know if it's going to work. But what you can know is that you can take a step forward in faith rather than fear. And God will lead and direct your path. And so today I'm praying you're going to be like David. And you're going to go out and face Goliath. Today I'm praying you're going to be like Joshua. And then you're going to march around Jericho. Today I'm praying that you're going to have that kind of faith that maybe today is the day. And not just today, but tomorrow when you wake up. And the next day that you get up and the day after that, that you're going to get up and you're going to believe and you're going to trust God. And you're going to say, you know what, God, today might be the day. And if it isn't, Lord, I'm going to keep believing. And Lord, I'm going to keep trusting, and I'm going to keep hoping, and I'm going to keep listening for your direction, God, and I'm going to keep being faithful to what you say to me, Lord. Let's pray. Lord, you've given us your word, and you've said to us, Lord, that that today is the day, that, that now is the time, the moment for us to trust in you, to have faith, God. And Lord, I pray that you would help us to have faith today because, Lord, all we need is a little bit. Just faith the size of a mustard seed and it can move mountains. And Lord, I ask this morning that that for each of us here today, that that Lord, we we each need faith in a different area. Maybe we need faith for healing. Maybe maybe God, we're struggling in some area of our lives. Maybe maybe it's in our finances or in our marriages or in our families or, or God, maybe it's in some other place. But Lord, wherever it is today that we need faith, I pray, Father God, that we would place that faith not in the what, but in the who, in you. Because you are our hope. You are our salvation. You are our peace. You are the one who is able to make a way where there seems to be no way at all. 
You said, Lord, in Isaiah, that, that you would make a way in the wilderness. That you would, would, Father God, that you would make new roads where there were no roads. And God, this morning, there's, there's some of us here who have, have been losing hope. But today, Father God, I pray hope would be restored in us. That, Father God, that we might have faith. And that we might trust in you. And that, God, that we would be just crazy enough to believe you for something amazing. Because you are able. And so, Lord, it might not happen today. And maybe not even tomorrow. But, God, you know what? We're going to keep trusting. We're going to keep hoping. We're going to keep believing and knowing that our God not only is able, but he's willing. You're willing and you're moving on our behalf, God. And our faith is always at work, Lord, even when we don't always understand what our faith is doing because our faith is in you and your ways are higher than our ways and your thoughts are higher than our thoughts. And Lord, we're just going to trust you in this season of our lives, in this season in our church, in this season in our community, in this season around the world, God. We're going to trust in you because our hope is in you because, Lord, if our hope isn't in you, then our hope, Lord, is, is really hopeless. But because of you, Jesus, we have a great hope. And Lord, we thank you this morning for your mercy and your grace. It's going to bring us through. Maybe you're here this morning and today for you, that step of faith that you need to take today is, is a step of faith where, where you trust in God for salvation. Maybe for you today, it's that, it's that first step in saying, you know what, I, I've been struggling to believe God for my salvation. And, and if that's you today, then let's, let's make that step of faith right where you are. Just, just lift your hand up and, and, and let's, let's do it right now. Surrender to Jesus. Praise God. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Anybody else? Thank you, Jesus. Let's just pray right now a prayer of faith, a prayer of believing and trusting in God for his salvation. Just repeat after me right now in faith and just say, Jesus, I surrender my life to you. And I ask you to save me, to transform me, to make me new. My life is yours. I believe that you died and you rose again on the third day and that you are my hope and my salvation and I put my trust in you so have your way in me today Jesus cleanse me and make me whole as I repent of my sin and I turn away from that life into the life of saving grace in Jesus name I pray amen